open up to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 1, and uh, last time we turned to Isaiah, we went through the 10th uh, verse, but want to pick up at the 11th verse. Now, let me share a couple things with you. We have not studied through the book of Isaiah, the entire book here in our church, in, in quite a few years. I think the last time was maybe in the 90s. Uh, we have gone through the book before. Uh, the truth of the matter is, almost over the years here, you say, well, why are you repeating? Well, over the years here, and it's, it's been probably 15 years ago that we had finished going through all the books of the Bible. And so the fact that we went through them all doesn't mean that we learned everything that was in them. And so uh, it, it makes sense to look through them again and learn what God's Word has to say. Isaiah is the first of the major prophets, and they're called major prophets partly because they are longer books, but also because of their subject matter. Isaiah, for example, has been called the, the Little Bible and covers pretty much the same uh, subject matter as the entire Bible covers, and it is 66 chapters. Now, obviously, when it was first written, it wasn't in the chapter verse divisions that came along later. But the words are the same words as they are. Some years ago, uh, I'm standing at the shrine of the book, which is in the vicinity of Jerusalem, and it is a building that houses what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the building itself is shaped like one of the clay jars that they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in. And the very center of it, you see out of the roof of the building what looks like a, a handle. And uh, in the very center of it is the Isaiah scroll. And that is the oldest copy of Isaiah known to exist. Now, it's not the original. It's not Isaiah's handwriting. But it is the oldest copy of Isaiah known to exist. Now, I'll be very straightforward about this. I am not a scholar of the Hebrew language. I know a few Hebrew words. It's the old joke is I know a little Hebrew and a little Greek. The Hebrew runs a delicatessen, the Greek runs a restaurant. But, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, I was just fascinated by that scroll. I was so fascinated standing there looking at that scroll of Isaiah, the oldest scroll of Isaiah in existence, that my root left, and I didn't know it. So I got left behind. <laughs> well, you, you did that too. Okay. And uh, so I thankfully was able to catch back up with them later. But, uh, I, I had no idea they had left. I was just engrossed in looking at that scroll. Well, we're going to look at it in English because most of us uh, can understand it better in English than in Hebrew. And I think that will be helpful to us. Isaiah chapter 1, and to begin with, we're going to be looking at verses 10 to 18, but to begin with, I want us to just look at verse 18. So if you would, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. The Lord is speaking, and the Lord says, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's God's invitation to us to reason together with him. I want to talk to you this evening about reasoning with God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for our time we have together. Thank you for the testimonies we've heard this evening. Thank you for the people who are gathered here. Thank you for the singing. And Lord, now as we have opened and as we look into your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher and our guide to guide us into all truth, to help us be the people who you'd have us to be. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's an obvious truth that the book of Isaiah has a clear presentation of salvation by grace through faith. Did the people of the Old Testament period know that salvation was by faith, they did. There are ample places. There, it, it's not true. It's a false teaching that people in the Old Testament were saved by keeping the law, whereas people in the New Testament were saved by keeping 
or not by keeping, but by grace. The New Testament makes it very clear the law never saved anybody. It's always by God's grace. And people in the Old Testament period knew about salvation and they knew about grace. David wrote, writes a great deal about it. The other writers as well. So Isaiah tells us about salvation by grace through faith. Now, Isaiah doesn't use that term. He doesn't say salvation is by grace through faith, but the idea is certainly there and it's understood. In the first nine verses, God demonstrated that the people, his people, the people of the nation of Israel, and more particularly the people of Judah, have become a sinful nation. As a matter of fact, he calls them Sodom. Now, this is not literal Sodom. This is Sodom. Uh, that Sodom, the first Sodom, was destroyed uh, back in the book of Genesis. But he's comparing them spiritually to Sodom. And he pleads with them to return to him. Let me say something else here that's very important in our understanding. Not only in understanding the book of Isaiah, but also in understanding prophecy and in understanding our relationship to evangelism. There is a teaching, and it's a false teaching, but it's gained a lot of, of traction in the United States in recent years called replacement theology. Replacement theology is the idea that the church has replaced Israel. So all the promises God made to Israel are no longer valid, and they now belong to the church. Now the problem with that teaching is that it is not biblical. It's not what the Bible teaches. God talks to Israel, he talks to the people of Judah, and he tells them you've sinned spiritually, you're like Sodom. But he doesn't say, I'm cutting you off forever, and there's never any hope for you. What he does in Isaiah, and in Jeremiah, and in Ezekiel, and in Daniel, and he pleads with them to turn and come back to him. In the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel, it's interesting, in the 3rd chapter of Ezekiel, then in the 33rd chapter, you'll find almost the same words. God issues a call to Ezekiel in the 3rd chapter, and then he reiterates it in the 33rd chapter. And there he tells Ezekiel that he's a watchman to the house of Israel. And he is there to warn them. And he's there to plead with them to do what? To turn. To turn from their wickedness and turn back to him. And in that 33rd chapter, God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. We mentioned that this morning. The truth of the matter is, God never rejoices when someone passes out of this world into eternity without being saved. It's never something that God, God never delights in the death of the wicked. No pleasure in the death of the wicked. We also quoted this morning Jesus' words, where he said the Son of Man uh, came to, uh, has not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The very reason that the Messiah Christ, the Savior, was sent into the world was so that people would be saved, and beginning with the house of Israel. Remember in John 4 this morning, it said salvation is of the Jews. What does that mean? Well, it means the same thing that Romans 1.16 means. Romans 1.16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. What does he mean when he says to the Jew first? The gospel came to the Jewish people first. They had it first. So it shouldn't surprise us that God, in and through the prophet Isaiah, is pleading with Israel to turn their hearts, to repent of their sin, and to come back and trust him. Let's take a look, then beginning at verse 10. We left off there last time. We'll pick up there this time. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offering.
offerings of grain, and of the fat of fed beasts. I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. What God is saying here is this. First of all, verse 10, he's saying, hear the word of the Lord. Hear what I'm saying to you. In verse 11, he's saying, I'm tired of your sacrifices. Now, wait a minute. Didn't God institute these sacrifices? Didn't God tell them to make these sacrifices? Yes. But understand, all of the sacrifices under the Old Testament, all of the offerings of animals, was a picture, a portrait of the true Lamb of God. It was a type or picture prefiguring the Savior who would come. But you know what God's saying in verse 11? He's saying, it, it doesn't mean anything to you anymore. It has become just a cold, dead ritual. You're doing it because you have to do it. You're doing it because it's routine. I want to share something with you. We have uh, the Lord's Supper schedule. And we have the Lord's Supper periodically. We try to keep it on a, a bi-monthly basis. There are churches that have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. There are churches that have the Lord's Supper uh, every first Sunday of every month. Did you know the Bible does not tell us how often to have the Lord's Supper? It tells us to have it. It says as often as you do this, but it doesn't tell us how often to do it. Why don't we do it every Sunday? Would it be wrong to do it every Sunday? It certainly would not be wrong to do it every Sunday. So are churches that have the Lord's Supper every Sunday, are they wrong to do so? No, they're not wrong at all. Uh, what about churches that do it first Sunday of the month? Are they wrong? No, they're not. Hmm. Then why don't we do that? Why don't we either do it first Sunday of the month or, or, or even every Sunday? Yeah, it wouldn't be wrong. Others do it. So why not? I'm going to tell you why. Two reasons. Uh, this is, and I hope this doesn't surprise anybody. If it does, you need to talk to me after the service, and we'll, we'll try to come to an understanding on but uh, this is a Baptist church. Uh, I hope that didn't surprise anybody. <coughs> and in many Baptist churches, not all, and this is pure tradition. No word in the scripture doesn't tell you to do this. But in many Baptist churches, the Lord's Supper is held quarterly. And we used to do it quarterly, and then uh, people said, well, we'd like to do it a little more often, so we went more to a bi-monthly basis. Well, why not have it more often? We can't. But you know why I don't think we should? I don't want it to become a routine. I don't want it to become something, oh, well, we're doing this again. All right, I did my thing. I had my little cracker. I had my little sip of juice. And, all right, we're done with that. It should never be like that. It should never be like that. It should always be a part of our worship. It should always be a memorial service for the Lord Jesus. It should all, well, preacher, I could do that every Sunday. Good. I'm not saying you can't. Not at all, I'm not saying, but I'm saying to some people it might become a little routine. Okay, well, I, I'm not sure I agree with that. Okay, and we can talk about it later if you want to. Always open to discussion. But these offerings, which were supposed to be offerings, the Lord had become just that. They become routine. They become meaningless. Verse 12, he said, When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when I spread, I'm sorry, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. You know what God's saying? He's saying, your worship is no longer acceptable. It's not only no longer acceptable, it's no longer pleasing. Your worship is empty. And you come to me with empty ritual and empty routine, and you come to me 
not repent of your sins. Remember what Jesus said about giving an offering? He said, if you come to give your offering, and as you go to give it, you remember that your brother has something against you. He said, first go and get reconciled with your brother, then come back and give your offering. Why did he say that? Because he wants us to come with a right heart. And he's saying these, the blood of bulls and goats never took away sin. Hebrews tells us that. And he's saying, I want you to come not out of ritual, not out of routine, not out of religion. But I want you to come and worship me from your heart. And we talked this morning about what is worship. And worship is coming and recognizing the authority and the majesty and the holiness of God. When we come with unrepentant hearts and to give our offerings, we're not recognizing the holiness of God. We need to look at ourselves and see us, as we just sang a little bit ago, as only sinners saved by grace. Can, can I help you with something? And, and maybe everybody here is already doing this. If you are, that's wonderful. But if you're not, let, let me help you with something. Every day when you pray, you should start your prayers by confessing your sins. Oh, wait a minute, preacher. I got saved and my sins were forgiven. That's wonderful. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, why did you bring that up? Because that is the answer to the question that I've been asked so often with people who are newly saved, and it's a legitimate question, by the way. Well, now that I've been saved, now the Lord has forgiven me, what if I sin again? Really, that's the wrong question. It's, it's, a, it's a legitimate question because it's, it's what the person is wondering about what they want to have answered. But if they knew a little bit more, they would not say, what if I sin again? They, they would say, what do I do when I sin again? Because you will. You will. I've only met two people in my lifetime who talked about that, that they believe they had reached sinless perfection. They, they, they had gotten to the point where they didn't sin anymore. And first was a lady. She actually didn't claim that she herself had received, uh, had reached sinless perfection. She said her aunt had. She had not to have reached sinless perfection. She didn't sin. She'd never sinned in her life, never did anything wrong. She was sinlessly perfect. And I tried to talk to the lady about that. She wouldn't hear it. I said, well, nobody's sinless perfect. She said, what about Mary? I said, what about Mary? Wasn't she sinlessly perfect? I said, Mary called on God, her Savior. Well, apparently not. I couldn't change this lady's mind. Her aunt was sinlessly perfect in her mind. Now I met a man who said that he had he had reached that state in his life where he was sinlessly perfect. He didn't sin anymore. And he spent probably 20, 30 minutes telling me how perfect he was. Oh. <laughs> and I listened and I said, you know, he kind of took a breath, and I listened, and I said, can I ask your wife about that? <laughs> you know, he didn't say, yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> and those who know us best, know us best. Yeah. That's why Jesus says, the prophet's not heard in his own country among his own people. Because they know us. They know who we are. They know our faults are faithful. <laughs> God is saying, when we come to worship, recognize his holiness. Come with the right heart. Recognize his majesty. Do we have to, does the Bible say you have to bow your head and close your eyes when you pray? You know it doesn't say that. Not only does it not say that, there's several times in the Bible where it says people lifted up their eyes and prayed. Mm -hmm. Is it wrong to do that? Is it wrong to look up towards heaven and pray? No, obviously not. <coughs> Jesus did that. So that's not wrong. So why do we bow our head and close our eyes? Well, it's just routine. And somebody taught me to do that when I was little, and I've just always done it. Well, you could do it for that reason, but how about this? How about we realize we're coming into the presence of the holy God, the 
majesty, the creator and king of the universe. And then, when we worship, we should be recognizing the love of God, the love that God has for us. And we should be thanking him, not only for the daily blessings he gives us, not only for his care, but for his love. And when we worship God, we need to offer him ourselves. Not just our offerings, but ourselves. Oh, I've told you this story before. I think it'll help to tell it again. I read this. It was in uh, England many years ago, oh, 150 years ago or so. And there was a small <laughs> church, and they had had uh, not such a good year. Church attendance was low. Not many people were coming. And nobody, nobody had professed the Lord during that year. They had a revival meeting. They had an evangelist come in. In those days, he probably didn't just come for four or five days or a week. He probably came for a month. And during that whole evangelistic meeting, they had one Salvation decision. You know that? The revival meeting was over. The elders of the church went to the pastor and said, Pastor, we think you ought to resign. Mm. You're a failure. Mm -hmm. Nobody getting saved here. The church is not growing. We don't think you ought to continue as our pastor. And you know, the pastor agreed. During that year, during that revival meeting, one little boy had said that he trusted the Lord. That one little boy, his name was Robert Moffat. Robert Moffat grew up to be a great missionary to the people of Africa. Robert Moffat's daughter married the great Dr. David Livingston, who was a great missionary to Africa. <clears throat> So was that church a failure? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. It's not how much we give the Lord that counts. Remember the story of Jesus? He said the, the widow who cast in two mites had given more than all the others who gave offerings that day. Why? Because she gave all she had. There was another service. In that same church, Robert Moffat was still quite young and they passed the offering plate. Robert Moffat had no money. And when the plate came to him, he took it. He was sitting right about here. He took it and he put it on the floor and he went, went and stood, put his feet in the offering plate. So he said, oh, what's he doing? What did he beat the offering plate? And he said, I have nothing that I can give to the Lord except myself. Amen. And he did. He did. This is what God is saying here. God is saying, come with a heart of worship. Don't just come and do ritual. Don't just come and do routine. We Baptists like to talk about how the uh, high churches, uh, the Reformation churches, are all high church. They aren't all high church, but that's what said. And, and they're all high church, and they're too wrapped up in formalism. I'm not going to totally argue with that, but let me bring something to you. Suppose you're in a Baptist church, and you just come and sing the hymns, but they don't mean a thing to you. You give in the offering because other people around you are giving, and you don't want them to think ill of you. You sit through the sermon, but you think, it's going to get done. Instead of focusing on the Lord, you're focusing on the people around you. What makes you wear that same dress last night? Mm -hmm. now, about time you came to church again. Is that any different? Is it any worse to be in a high church with formalism than, or to be in a church like this 
and not having a heart tuned in to the Lord. It's pretty much the same thing, isn't it? That's what God's saying. But he's not finished. Look at verse 15. He said, when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear it. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes and cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. These are the things you ought to do. First, what, what does he say? Watch carefully. First thing you need to do is you need to wash. You need to be cleansed. Wash you and make you clean. How, how do we do that? Do we get baptized? Well, Isaiah wouldn't have talked about being baptized. They didn't have baptism in there. No, they didn't have baptism as we say it. But you know what they had? That was called a mikvah, a, a ritual bath, where you would wash yourself before you came to the temple to worship. They really did. Yeah, they really did. Wash you. Make you clean. <clears throat> How are you going to get clean? I mentioned this morning, I said, when we sing the hymns here in church, pay attention to the words. Pay attention to what they have to say. What did we sing tonight? We sang at Calvary. We sang only a sinner saved by grace. And then we sang, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed me white as snow. Not to him we didn't sing tonight, but we sing here from time to time. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So <coughs> precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You need to pay attention to the same these words. Understand what they mean and how they apply to us. So he says, wash you. Be cleansed. Again, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John 1, 9. Do you know in that same passage, John writes, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What sin? All sin. What about, there is no what about, but there is no but. All sin. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doing. The word put away there is the same term that uh, Malachi uses. In the book of Malachi, he says the Lord God, he is putting away. And in Malachi, Malachi is talking about divorce. So you know what he's saying? He's saying, divorce yourself from your evil doings. Whatever you're doing wrong, stop doing it. You know, if, if, if I'm doing something wrong, I can say I'm sorry, I can apologize for it, I can say, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that, but if I keep doing it, it's not very sincere, is it? You need to stop. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody in, in I started to say in the world, what if it was only in our country? Everybody just said, I'm not going to do evil anymore. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, don't hold your breath on that happen. That'd be wonderful. Think how much better place the world would be. No, that's evil. I'm not going to do that. So he says, learn to do well. Learn to do well. Learn what is right. Don't just not do wrong. He says, don't do wrong. But he says, then learn to do right. How am I going to learn to do right? Well, good place to start be the Bible, isn't it? God tells us what it is he wants us to do. And most of the times, he also tells us how to do it. Learn to do well. How would I start to do what I want to see? How about if I started with 
Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Love thy neighbors thyself. That'd be a good starting point, wouldn't it? Well, what would I do next? How about I said, um, continue that second idea, and I said, hmm, whatsoever I would that men should do to me, I shall do to them also. That'd be a good place to start learning to do well. Treat other people the way you want them to be treated. Honor God above all. Treat other people the way you want them, not the way they treat you. Most of us treat other people the way they treat us. Somebody's rude and nasty to us, we'll show them we can be even more rude and nastier than they can be. <laughs> you don't think so? You don't drive if you don't think so. <laughs> what about this? What about we just, even when we're driving, treat other people the way we want to be treated? Learn to do well. Seek judgment. What does it mean, seek judgment? Oh, I know what that means, preacher. See these people out here, they're doing wrong, and we're going to pray God to rain fire and brimstone down on their heads. You know, that's not what he means here. That's not what he's saying. You know what he's saying when he says seek judgment? He's saying seek justice. Seek righteousness. Seek for the right to be done. Next phrase, relieve the oppressed. Relieve the oppressed. Don't be the oppressor, relieve the oppressed. I mean, I, lots of ways people are oppressed. There's no question about that. I'm going to say this in the hopes that it will help you understand what the Lord and through Isaiah is saying to us here. I can't stand bullets. I really can't. I can't stand somebody who bullies somebody else. I just can't. It, it bothers me. I don't like it. And I haven't witnessed that personally in, in quite a while. I'm thankful for that. But when I have witnessed it, what do you do? Well, you jump right in there and defend the person who's being bullied. Can't that get you in trouble? Everybody do this. Yes, it can. That can get you in trouble. I can tell you some stories about that. We don't have time. Relieve the oppressed. Help out people that you can help. Now, granted, now I've said this often, but I think it needs to be repeated because you need to come to this realization. There are some folks you can't help, and it's not because you don't want to help. It's because you don't have what they need. Relieve the oppressed. Judge. The fatherless. When it says judge the fatherless, it doesn't mean condemn the fatherless. It's not what it means at all. Judge the fatherless. Treat the fatherless righteously. Treat them fair. And take care of them. You know what God says? God says, I'll be a father to the fatherless. If you don't have a father, I'll be your father. Judge the fatherless. Treat them right. And plead for the widow. You know, in James it says that we all take care of widows and orphans. There's something to that. All that to get us to this point, and here's where we're going to finish up tonight. Verse 18. The Lord says, Come now. You go to all the religions of the world. And in none of them, other than biblical Judeo-Christianity, does their God ever say, come to me. All of them say, go, go and do, go and do this, go and do that. Do the Hindu gods ever say, come to me? They don't. Did Buddha ever say, come to me? He didn't. Now listen to me. Does Allah ever say, come to me? He doesn't. The God of the Bible does. He says, come. Come now. Come and let us reason together. Would you like to just sit down with God and reason some things through, talk some things over? 
Well, that's exactly what he's inviting you to do. Come now, let us reason together. And in this case, never separate a verse from its context. So in this context, what does it mean? What is God inviting us to reason with him about? Our sin. So that when we come to worship, it's not empty, heartless worship. So that we're in this right relationship, this close relationship with him. Come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. What's going to happen when we sit down and we reason with God? Well, that's where we start to be right with God. You know what's going to happen when we reason with God? We're going to start to see things as he sees them. And if we begin to see things as he sees them, then we're going to begin to see ourselves the way he sees us. Shortly after I was saved, I was encouraged to, to read the Bible daily, and I began to do that. And I'm not sure why. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I had a reason, but I, I'm not sure exactly why I made this choice. But I decided to start in the Book of Romans. Maybe I was told to do it. I'm, I'm not sure. But I began to read the Book of Romans. And as I read the Book of Romans, I began to see myself on the pages of the book of Romans. I began to see myself the way God saw me. It wasn't a pretty picture. I looked in the mirror, but didn't like what I saw. But then there's a part that I did like. It wasn't about me at all. It was about him. Come now, let us reason together, save the Lord. Though your sin be a scar, a deep red, the color of blood, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as blood. That's what the Lord is saying. Come to Him, rest in Him, trust in Him. He will cleanse your heart. He'll save your soul. And if you've been saved and you've been out and you've gotten dirty walking in this world, come to him. He'll clean you. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we would sit down and just let God reason with us? I'm a big fan of this movement that's, that's gained a lot of popularity. It's not brand new in the last few years, but it's gained a lot of popularity in the last few years. It's actually an old idea. That's the idea of using apologetics for evangelism. Now, apologetics isn't saying, you know, I'm sorry that, that we did that. It's not what it's about. It's defending the faith. It's explaining why we believe what we believe. It's reasoning through the scriptures. Do you know that's what God is saying here? Let's sit down and reason again. Paul puts it this way. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How are you going to do that? How are you going to think like Jesus? You're going to have to get into his word, let his word be in you. Come now. Reason with the Lord. What's going to happen when you do? Well, as I say, you'll see yourself as he sees you. You'll confess your sins. You'll be like Peter. When Peter said, depart from me, O Lord, for I'm a sinful man. I'm not worthy to be in your presence. You'll be like the Roman soldier who sent his servants to Jesus and said, Lord, my servant's sick, but I'm not worthy for you to come to my house. Would you just say the word? I know he'll be evil. You'll be like that. And you'll know and you'll understand how God looks at your heart. Come now, let us reason together, say the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, though they be red like crimson, they should be white as snow. They should be as wood. Be clean. 
I remember a good many years ago, got a phone call at home on Saturday. It was one of the teenage young men from the church here. He called me up and said, you know, Pastor, I just called to tell you, I've been doing a lot of praying. He says, I realize that I haven't been living the way I ought to. My life hasn't been right. And I've been a lot of, doing a lot of praying. I've, I've asked God to forgive me. And I feel so clean. Those are his words. I feel so clean. That's exactly what it says here. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as blue. And what's going to be the result of your reasoning with the Lord? Well, you're going to see yourself as He sees you. You're going to come to Him. You're going to be cleansed. And then you can be a witness for Him. You know what David said? In when he prayed his great prayer of confession, he said, when his sins were forgiven, then, then sinners shall be converted. Let's pray to you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you that we can take time to reason with you and let you reason with us. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you no matter what has happened in our life, no matter what's occurred, no matter what temptation has come along, and we can come to you and be clean. Though our sins are as scarlet, they shall be as wool. As snow, if they red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. The invitation is simple tonight. If God spoken to your heart and you need to respond, this is the time to come. Father, bless and move this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.